our next speaker again is is Dr. Hancock. So I wanted to um, provide a little bit of uh, update on some bailage work that uh, our center is is doing, as well as some other experiences that we've had over the years uh, with this balance of moisture, the fermentation, and the risk that are associated with bailage. And I thought what I would do here is, is start first with a brief review of, of silage because silage is nothing new. Actually, silage has been uh, something that we've used as, as uh, a, a civilization for, for some time. Uh, but basically to make sure everyone's on the same page, silage is, is a process of fermentation, taking sugars and turning them into organic acid. And that organic acid is what actually helps prevent the spoilage from occurring. So there are certain bacteria that can take plant sugars and convert those over into organic acids. And these actually inhibit the growth of certain fungi. So those acids, as they reduce the pH, they inhibit the, um, the enzymes that actually uh, serve the, the function for fungi to be able to uh, consume um, the material, the dry matter. And uh, this, this acid actually stops that process by that inhibition of that enzyme. So this is nothing new. I mean, this is uh, a process of anaerobic storage that has been used for time immemorial on uh, food products and, and many other um, uh, ways to preserve a uh, valuable resource here. And this low pH, as I mentioned, is what really stops that enzymatic activity, but it also helps to uh, detour and inhibit undesirable bacteria, Clostridia, as well as uh, Listeria. So I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. Actually, uh, one of the first things I got this morning was an email from a, a producer that we were working with who uh, has been dealing with some Listeriosis issue. And, and uh, so, pH is definitely an, an issue there that can, can come to play. So silage has been around actually since uh, 1500 BC. It's uh, written about in archives in Egypt and in Carthage. So it's something that has been used for a very long uh, period of time. But I think it warrants discussion about what, what's the rationale, what build the argument for why we would choose baleage over hay. The previous speakers did a great job talking about how they've developed a hay production system and marketing of that product and, and some using baleage in that process as well, which uh, that new packaging of baleage was quite interesting too. But why choose baleage over hay? Well, this is a pretty common reason, right? Is uh, some of the weather risk associated with um, uh, baleage uh, with hay production and getting some of that hay damaged during the process. And, I've been working on baleage actually since my graduate days. Um, and, and this is some research out of that program uh, that was uh, published a little bit later after my master's thesis. And we looked at the, the uh, loss in fiber, or excuse me, the increase in fiber during storage. And so on the right here, you see uh, post storage versus pre storage. And this is for the silage, this is baleage, and this is for uh, hay. And you can see this is basically the storage loss associated with um, uh, storing hay. Once we put it into the barn, it just doesn't stop um, any kind of respiration. That respiration continues on. So we actually will see some increase in uh, NDF, for example, as a result of that. Well, in trial two, we actually had a rain event. And so here we see uh, some of the rain challenges for uh, producing that hay. And then we had further storage loss on top of that. Now, silage also has many other benefits too. In addition to that lowered risk of rain damage and less storage loss, it also enables a more timely harvest. It allows for less leaf shatter. So we end up with better quality overall, more highly digestible forage, uh, higher crude protein, lower fiber levels, uh, and increased palatability as well. Silage does have a few risks and certainly the expense of the equipment, labor and plastic is significant. Uh, it can be 
uh, very, very challenging, particularly for smaller uh, operations, for this to be cost effective. Some of the economic analyses that we've done with Baylage uh, when I was at the University of Georgia and some colleagues at LSU and I uh, worked up an economic analysis of this. And basically we determined that a, uh, a beef cow calf herd, for example, of uh, about a hundred cows or more would probably be able to uh, find baleage to be economical, but less than that, probably it's going to be real challenging for that to, uh, to pay in the long run. Recycling of that plastic is, is uneconomical or pr impractical in many cases. I mean, there are some avenues of which that, that plastic can be recycled but getting enough volume of that to warrant uh, transport of it and make that cost effective has been really challenging. In certain areas where there is a lot of ag plastic use and there is already a mechanism for um, plastic recycling like that, uh, then yeah, there, there might be some opportunities there. But in general, it's, it's impractical and not really economical. The other thing I would encourage you to remember is there's nothing magical about wrapping this stuff with plastic. If you put garbage into it, you will get garbage back out of it. Uh, it doesn't transform it into something much better than what you, you started with. And one of the key considerations here is how wet, how moist that material is. And those targets for moisture can still be challenging to hit, at least consistently. In many cases, you might start baling at a, at, a, at a wet moisture, and by the time you end up in the field, maybe you, it's dried down such that it's, uh, it's too low. So on average, you might be okay, but you started a little wet and you ended a little dry. So those challenges uh, uh, you know, are, are very practical in nature and, and uh, not all that easy to always uh, hit the desired target. If we do go too wet, what we risk is a secondary fermentation, which I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And basically we increase the risk of botulism, which is a toxin that can, it's a neurotoxin, it's a very potent neurotoxin, it can kill the, the animal. Uh, if we go too dry, we end up with a product that may be too um, moldy. It may not have fermented very well. It may not have dropped enough of a pH to be stable. And so when we start feeding it, when we end up with a lot of mold. Now, both of these extremes are relatively rare, okay? But they are risks that need to be considered. So let's talk about the process here a little bit. So here's our baleage bale, our figurative baleage bale. And inside of that baleage bale is sugars. That forage contains sugars uh, that are acted on by bacteria and the absence of oxygen. So here's all the oxygen being kept out. Here's the uh, plastic layer that's uh, encapsulating the bale and, and creating an anaerobic condition inside of the bale. So those bacteria act on those sugars and convert that over into principally lactic acid. Uh, generally speaking, we see those levels to be between two and 8% lactic acid. Acetic acid, which generally would run between 0.5 to 3%, and then other acids. So propionic acid, butyric acid, which is a, a sign of, of uh, negative fermentation, uh, secondary fermentation. We might also get a, a wee bit of ethanol there too. So um, that can be also a sign of, of, of poor fermentation or not a desirable form of, of fermentation anyway. And then carbon dioxide. Okay. We principally are focused on lactic acid. We do get a little bit of acetic acid, uh, but really we're focused on uh, lactic acid. And then the propionic acid is, is there present too. And oftentimes we will see uh, ratios of some of these like lactic acid to acetic acid ratio or uh, even to lactic acid propionic acid ratios. <clears throat> but the principal number here is if we're doing a good job with forming lactic acid, Generally speaking, we're going to have good, uh, good fermentation. So here's kind of a schematic of how this proceeds. So if we look at the days after ensiling or bales, uh, days after wrapping and, and baling and wrapping here in the case of baleage, um, here's the population of bacteria that we're dealing with. And initially we have these heterofermentative bacteria. That's a long way of saying these, these are 
not quite as good at converting those sugars over into lactic acid. Uh, they may form a little bit of acetic acid, some of those others. But the faster we transition over here to the lactic acid bacteria, the faster we're going to get this pH drop. And we want to see this pH drop as quickly as possible because that stops the whole fermentation process and, and makes it stable and doesn't consume extra sugars during that process. We want to re keep some of those sugars around for uh, the, the uh, animals that we're going to be feeding it to. So in, in typical scenarios here for a grass, all right, grasses uh, tend to have quite a high sugar content and they tend to ferment very well. You may see a pH at the end here after about four weeks, it may drop down into low fours, maybe even below four, okay? With legumes, legumes are a little bit more buffered against a pH change. So it doesn't uh, decrease as quickly nor as extensively in legumes. And so we might see typically here for legumes, a pH of about 4.7, 4.6 maybe. Um, that, that would be considered a, a well fermented crop. Okay, so those are our goals for legumes and grass. And if we have some grass legume mix, it's probably, you know, just depending on the mix, it's gonna be somewhere in between. Now here's a, an important point to, to make is that baleage is different in terms of the silage fermentation than chopped silage. So if we, like in our research dairy, we, we feed a lot of alfalfa silage. And if we're making alfalfa silage, typically it's either going into a bunk or into an ag bag. And that pH drop is, is much more efficient, much more rapid than in baled silage. In baled silage, we might actually see it take uh, maybe even two months for it to, to drop uh, to its low point. Whereas with, um, with chop silage, it may also take a couple months to get to that, but it's, it's more rapidly dropping and more, more quickly dropping down to um, a, a, a safe and, and stable uh, environment there. So if we look at lactic acid levels, for example, in that chopped versus uh, baled silage, and the baled silage here is in the yellow, uh, what we can see is that we don't get as extensive of, of a decrease here um, in, in those situations. Here, if we look at the total fermentation, again, the baled silage doesn't drop as much uh, or doesn't produce as much um, uh, of these acids as does the chopped silage. So that pH doesn't drop uh, nearly as extensively as, as it would be in chopped silage. The advantage of baleage though is that it's easier. It uses a lot of the same equipment as haymaking. Um, it, it, it's within reach for many of our producers. It's more portable, at least to a degree, especially the individually wrapped bales are quite portable uh, compared to uh, silage, which basically you're gonna have to store it right next to wherever you're feeding the animals. Um, baleage typically is more cost effective for medium scale producers. Um, but that fermentation is not as rapid nor as complete. So that pH drop is not quite as ideal. For chopped silage though, it's going to be faster, especially if you're using scale appropriate equipment, uh, but it does use specialized equipment. And obviously that would need to be stored near a feeding area. And this is generally going to be more cost effective for uh, those larger scale operations. Okay, now let's talk about some of the details because paying attention to the details is really important. And for those of you that uh, are like me, you're already starting to uh, have an eye twitch. Paying attention to the details is very, very important. So detail number one, no rain damage. Even with baleage, we need to avoid rain damage because if we do get some rain damage on it, uh, that will leach out some of the water soluble carbohydrates and reduce the fermentable carbohydrates that are available so we don't get as extensive of, of a uh, decrease in, in pH. A second detail, plan ahead for baling and wrapping. And this is uh, the most common rookie mistake, if I can put it that way. 
A common thing when folks will first start getting into baleage is they will cut down way too much at one time. They might cut down what they're used to cutting down uh, for a hay operation. But for baling and wrapping, if we're making baleage, you want to cut down no more than one can later bale and wrap all within 12 hours. Okay, so you have to work backwards from the wrapping step because normally that's the that's the bottleneck. What you want to be able to do is bale and wrap everything within 12 hours. So you have to work backwards from that and say, okay, I'm not going to cut down any more than what I can safely bale and wrap within 12 hours. If we go beyond 12 hours, what ends up happening is you get some excessive heating and you get some extra dry matter loss. So that, that can be a real expensive proposition. So the best thing to do is to bale and wrap everything within 12 hours. Now, the sooner the better, and some of those uh, baled systems that wrap just as soon as it's uh, baled up, uh, those, those losses are gonna be minimal. But um, anytime it's sitting there, it's got the potential to, to heat up and to lose some of its uh, uh, dry matter, some of its sugar. We wanna maximize our bale size, but account for any added weight. Obviously, if uh, we're baling twice as much weight there because of the moisture. So consider that with your tractor size to make sure that uh, it's going to match what your equipment can handle. Uh, make dense bales. Uh, some of these systems now can make uh, in excess of 13 pounds of dry matter per cubic foot. And that's a very, very dense bale. I mean, in silage packs, generally we want 15 or 16 pounds per cubic foot or more. Um, but you know, if we can achieve that in a baler, that's, that's actually doing really, really good. It is good to use a pre-cutting system. I think I may actually talk about this more later, but a pre-cutting or the knives that are in some of these uh, uh, balers allow for that chop to chop length to be much smaller and uh, it's very helpful when using it in a mixed ration. You don't have to grind that, that forage as long. Uh, it mixes a whole lot easier that way. It's also important to use net wrap. Net wrap is kind of a, uh, uh, we take it for granted now, but net wrap is a key thing for field efficiency, but also it helps to lay the stems down so you don't get any or, or fewer chances for that plastic to be punctured uh, by the stems as it's being wrapped. Next detail is choose a good site for wrapping. So feed uh, near a feeding area is really where it would be ideal to wrap your bales. Uh, handling it as uh, little as possible really is encouraged um, because it does risk damage every time you touch that bale. Ensure though that your site poses a low risk. First of all, choose a good sod or level site that has no risk of punctures to that plastic. It's also a good idea to mow or prevent weeds around those bales because that tends to uh, uh, allow for rodents and other types of uh, uh, pest problems to, to uh, be around. And if the rodents are around, then you have uh, coyotes or other types of uh, animals that are after those rodents and they may be climbing all over the bales, et cetera. The other thing to consider is located at least about 12 feet from a fence line. And the reason for this is that uh, birds tend to light on these bales. And if you can keep it a little distance from a fence line, um, you actually encourage them to be more on the fences rather than on the bales. And they'll tend to walk across and claw in it, peck at it, et cetera. So uh, avoid that by getting a little distance between it and the fence line. You need to definitely regularly observe for damage and tape any holes that might have occurred. Um, one of the worst case scenarios I had run into during my extension career is we had a gentleman who had about 150 round rolls that was uh, damaged by a vandal. And basically they'd cut all the plastic for all 150 rolls and he didn't notice it for a few days and ended up with a, with a total loss. Uh, if you notice it real quickly, you should be able to get that uh, patched up or rewrapped in this case. Uh, but if you're not uh, paying regular attention to it, uh, it could really cause some severe loss. At least six layers on individual wrapped bales, and I prefer eight layers on inline bales. And the reason for that is you've got a lot more tension where those bales meet up. 
and especially if they're not uh, sized correctly and, and are not uniform. And that stress on that plastic tends to make it a little thinner. So eight layers is a good practice for inline bales. I also like to use end caps. Now I realize those end caps are expensive. However, it's cheaper than losing a bale. And it's also cheaper than losing an animal. If you've got uh, enough oxygen in intrusion into that uh, tube, then you can actually create a, a secondary fermentation and botulism risk as a result. And then again, tape any holes that might occur uh, for that, uh, that plastic to avoid any oxygen getting in, or at least minimizing it. Ensure the wrap is routed through with the, uh, the stretch rollers applying the appropriate amount of stretch to it and that the wrap is tacky side toward the bale. So you have uh, adhesion between the, the wraps. Probably one of the most common mistakes is that these stretch rollers are not adequately cleaned and they are overstretching the, the uh, material. So check, check your stretch length regularly by just making you know a couple of marks with a um, with some uh, uh, a sharpie or something like that that is say an inch apart. Run it through the stretcher, and if it's not if it's more than an inch and three quarters apart, then then you are overstretching that plastic. The the tacky material that holds those uh, layers together, oftentimes that will gravitate down to the uh, to the gears to the bearings and it will cause that uh, roller to overstretch. So regularly clean those to prevent overstretching of the plastic. That's a key, key problem. As I already mentioned, uh, uh, we wanna shoot for about a 50 to 70% stretch. Okay, then getting into the moisture. And this is one of the real points of this talk is to really focus on getting moisture right. At 40 to 60% is our target. If we look at alfalfa bales, and again, going back to uh, uh, an article that I wrote uh, several years ago now, following my master's research, um, at 60% moisture, we're getting a really good pH drop here for alfalfa. 4.5 is really good for alfalfa. At kind of a medium level of, of, P, of uh, moisture, we're getting an intermediate pH level. So it's in the fours, which is still acceptable. Uh, for alfalfa, but you know we we want to definitely be below below five. Now, if we start getting on the dry side, we don't get as much fermentation, and as a result, um, you know we're not seeing as as extensive of a decrease in pH. In this case, excuse me, it was above five, so we have some real challenges there. So here's what's happening in the real world. This is some survey work that uh, Dr. Jimmy Henning, who's uh, Kim's counterpart down at the University of Kentucky, uh, they did some survey work, work with their growers there. And what they found was that the majority of folks are not really hitting the targets. Um, if you look at that, that falls between 41 and 60%, um, you know, and, and you look at what's happening outside of that, it's, it's tough to hit that mark. And so it's really, really crucial uh, to get that in that 40 to 60% range, but in practice, it's sometimes uh, more difficult to do that. So how do we determine that moisture? Well, there are some hay moisture probes and testers that are out on the market. Uh, honestly, I, in the work that I've done with those over the years, I've found them to be really un, imprecise uh, is a kind way of putting it. Uh, frankly, I've, experienced uh, that most producers that have done this for a little while, they're probably better by feel than they are with those hay moisture or forage moisture testers. Um, however, uh, the moisture, the microwave moisture test is really uh, the best way in, in most practical way of de dealing with this in the field. Uh, you may need to uh, make a run to the barn or something like that where you've got power or run an inverter from your vehicle or something like that to be able to run the uh, the microwave, but you know, for 40 or 50 bucks for a cheap microwave and $20 for a, a scale, you can be in business to uh, to be able to do that. Um, of course, the, the standard is a drying oven and um, those are uh, available in kind of a miniature form in these uh, coaster testers. But uh, 
we've come a long way with the the in bail sensors, and those in bail sensors I think are are quite a bit better than than the uh, hay moisture probes, uh, mainly because you're getting better contact. But there's not been a lot of uh, good research data with those uh, in baler moisture systems. But we do know that they're taking a lot more samples, a lot more readings, and, and most likely they are more reliable uh, than, than, uh, than others. But going back to this feel, uh, that's probably the one that most folks will rely on and, and a common moisture measurement to determine if it's too wet or not is to conduct what I call the dish rag test. If you can take a handful of forage and wring it out like you're wringing out a dish rag, if you express any moisture from that, there's any droplets that come out of that, most likely you're, you're too wet. So um, at the point at which you're no longer doing that, then you probably are right in that uh, 40 to 60% range and, and uh, ready to go. So let's look at what happens at these different moisture levels. So uh, lactic acid level, as, as I mentioned before, is really a great indicator of good fermentation and in that recommended moisture range of 40 to 60%, um, this is alfalfa baleage from two different uh, cuttings in uh, Wayne Koblenz's is work in central Wisconsin. And you know, if we're, if we're in that 40 to 60% range, we should be getting uh, a fair amount of lactic acid being pr produced here. Similarly, again, going back to some survey work, from uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Henning down in uh, uh, Kentucky, uh, 40 to 60%. If we look at the uh, pH, which I believe is the blue and the organic acid, uh, lactic acid here in the green, what you can see is that we are getting some level of uh, pH here as long as we're at about 40 or, or 40 to 60%. Now, of course, if we get more moisture, we're, we're going to uh, see additional levels of lactic acid, but then we start running into issues of a secondary fermentation or a concern about botulism. So let's talk a little bit about botulism and what it is. The first thing I would say about botulism though, is that the fear of botulism is probably one of the most important or most common barriers against producers adopting the use of baleage. But this risk is low if our moisture is on target. So, you know, it is a risk, but I, I think many folks have overblown this risk of, of botulism. It is relatively rare for us to have a problem with botulism. It can happen. There's no doubt about it. I've experienced it in my career several times, but usually because someone wasn't paying attention to those details that I was talking about earlier. If the pH fails to drop low enough and quickly enough, what you can also oftentimes have is a secondary fermentation. And that's basically where any excess sugar and lactic acid can be used further by anaerobic bacteria in the silage. And they use it for energy as well. So they're taking that lactic acid and turning it into energy and a byproduct is butyric acid. You also get a lot of dry matter loss because this is an, uh, a, a loss intensive carbon dioxide intensive process. And the process of producing this butyric acid is, is just inefficient. And so what's in, what ends up happening is you get a lot of dry matter loss and you get spoilage, you get lower quality feed. Now Clostridium botulinum is a soil borne bacteria that contributes to this secondary fermentation. And this is a very risky one because it produces the botulism or botulinum toxin. This is the extremely potent neurotoxin behind botulism. So this is a, a major risk, uh, but let, let me just say again, it's, it is, if you're paying attention to the details, this risk is quite low. So here's what is a great indicator though of botulism or other secondary fermentation is butyric acid. So as the pH, or excuse me, as the, uh, the bale moisture increases, um, we run into some greater risk here for butyric acid because you're getting more uh, lactic acid that's being formed. 
So if we look at a compilation of multiple studies that uh, Dr. Wayne Koblenz in our center has conducted over the years, we see that there is a much greater risk as we get above 55, 60% here, there's much greater risk of high levels of butyric acid. Now, just because you have a high level of butyric acid does not necessarily mean you're going to have botulism. However, it does indicate that there's a greater risk of that botulism to occur. Okay. Same story here from uh, work, the survey work in, in Kentucky, where above 60% we're seeing more uh, botulism, or excuse me, butyric acid risk. So how do we avoid this risk? We avoid contamination with soil. That's the most common way of getting it in. So adjust your harvest equipment to minimize soil contamination, increase your cutting height, flatten the angle of your disc mower instead of arching it over really sharp, uh, lay, lay that disc mower back a little bit so it's a little bit more flat. That's, it's important to do that for a variety of reasons anyway, but especially for this. And be less aggressive with a rake. If we're really uh, dragging up a lot of soil, that can be a problem. So use something like a rotary rake or a merger rather than a wheel rake. And then test your baleage for quality and include fermentation measures in that too. Pay attention to uh, getting a good representative sample, things that Kim I'm sure has taught you over the years, but be sure to take those holes and then look for pH. That's your first indicator. A low pH is great. Uh, high levels of lactic acid are great. And then low levels of butyric acid is what you're really shooting for here. Ash content is also kind of a secondary indicator. Um, if you have a lot of ash, that usually indicates a lot of soil contamination and that increases the risk of uh, botulism. So real briefly in the summary, baleage has many advantages and can be cost effective for medium and large scale producers. Success with baleage requires paying attention to those details though, especially as it relates to those risks. We have to pay attention to the details to reduce our risk. And it's always best to test. Uh, once we uh, got that finished product, we wanna make sure that we are uh, feeding a good quality product to our, our livestock. With that, I'll stop and ask if you've got any questions or comments and I look forward to, uh, to interacting with you. We, we do have a couple of questions, Dr. Hancock, in the uh, chat. Um, I don't know if you're able to see those. That one is quite lengthy. <laughs> if you're not, I can read them to you. Give me just a second. I should be able to uh, pull them up. Um, let's see here. The first question is from William. With baleage, what is maximum of storage time if properly harvested and wrapped? What are the risk factors as time is extended? Uh, one one year plus storage time. That's a that's a great question, William. And actually, is one in which um, there's been a very limited amount of research. In general, most uh, folks will recommend no longer than about nine to ten months of storage. Uh, to feed that in the season in which you produced it. However, um, there has been some trials. I know that my colleagues and I, when I was at the University of Georgia, down in South Georgia, which is about as challenging an environment for baleage as one can get, uh, they were extending it out for 24 months to go a full two years with that baleage. Now, with enough plastic around it, theoretically, it should, uh, should last a good while. Uh, but that plastic is not completely impermeable to oxygen. So you do get some oxygen intrusion over time. You would get some deterioration over time and you would get some spoilage over time. So I still think that the, the best rule of thumb would be uh, feed it within a year at least. Um, you know, you might be able to go longer if you know that you're going to be able, you're going to need to carry it for longer periods of time. Uh, you may be able to uh, wrap it with a little extra plastic to extend it a little further, uh, but I would be cautious about doing that for much longer than, than uh, 12 months or so. Um, we mill our late season 
Yeah, so there's a comment here about uh, bailing up some uh, dead animals within some of the baleage, and that ended up uh, causing a, uh, an animal death. Yes, we can get some challenges uh, sometimes with that. Most commonly, I've experienced that with, uh, with rabbits, uh, with snakes as well, uh, getting those animals bailed up into a bale and you end up with uh, some, um, some major spoilage. Um, that can also lead to listeriosis as well as potentially uh, clostridial uh, botulism as well. Uh, but generally speaking, um, that's, that's a rarity. It, you know, there's risk in everything, but um, that, that can be a challenge. Um, what about some white mold on baleage? Yes, white mold is a pretty common uh, challenge in baleage, um, particularly where we have those inline bales butted up against one another. On those flat sides, we will often have a little bit of oxygen that's captured there or oxygen intr intrusion that is uh, seen there, and we'll get a little bit of white mold. White mold itself, that particular one, and I can give you the um, the reference material on this, the actual species of that white mold, it's not one that is dangerous. Um, if it is red or blue-green, those are very dangerous molds. If you see that, normally you smell it as well as you see it. So if it doesn't pass the smell test, then don't feed it. <laughs> um, you know, the, 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 the key thing about feeding baleage is you really do need to be observant with your senses, not just with your sight, but also with the smell. And, you know, it, it, you can tell bad baleage pretty quickly. If it doesn't have that real sweet uh, smell to it, it can be quite challenging. Um, see, I see one more question here. Can you line wrap bales of alfalfa grass mix at 20%? Uh, I'm presuming that's moisture and lower safely without creating fermentation. Just wondering if I could use it as an alternative to barn storage. That's a great question. And it's actually one in which uh, there's been a little bit of research. Uh, Krishona Martinson actually over at the University of Minnesota, uh, along with uh, Craig Schaefer and Wayne Koblenz in our center, looked at mix of orchard grass and alfalfa and they wrapped it at, at 20%. In their case, they were feeding it to, to horses. Uh, and yes, as long as you've got complete oxygen exclusion, okay, that you've wrapped it and, and used end caps and all of that, um, it, it basically is a status quo. So it doesn't, it doesn't ferment, but it doesn't deteriorate much at all, if any, either. You don't get the, the mold that you would get as if you were storing it in, in a hay barn. But once you open that package, then you can start getting some of those, some of that deterioration. Now, if you open that package in January and it's, you know, minus uh, five degrees outside, then, then you're not going to have much challenge at all. But if you open that package in July and it's regularly in the 80s and low 90s, uh, then yeah, we're, we're going to end up with some, some uh, challenges with spoilage, uh, well, heating more than anything. Uh, at, at that level. Any other questions or comments? I think that uh, I think you covered all the questions and I just want to thank you again for uh, attending today and speaking to us. Great information and we greatly appreciate that.